Are you ready to talk about what it means to be a kingdom builder? I love the kingdom of God. You know, the kingdom of God is eternal. It's within, according to Luke 17, 21. The actual word for kingdom in the Greek text is basileia, and it means rulership. So when we're talking about the kingdom of God, we're talking about God's sovereignty, his rulership, that we're not just here to confess our sins, although that's a very important part, but we're here to invite the sovereignty of God, the rulership of God in our lives. Jesus himself said, seek first the kingdom of God and all these things will be added. And so the, the revelation of the kingdom of God in our lives is transformative. It changes everything. It changes the way we approach our daily lives. And today I'm hoping that you will catch a glimpse of what it means to be part of the kingdom. In fact, did you know that we're living by a constitution of the kingdom? Some of you have carried that constitution in today, either in book form or on your phone. And our constitution says in section Philippians, subsection 3, article 20, that our citizenship is in heaven. Not that it will be, but that it is, that we're already part of the kingdom of God and we are eagerly awaiting the coming of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Here's the good news about the kingdom. We have a president of all presidents, a king of all kings. We don't have to be concerned about electing a president. We have the best president of all. And we don't have to be concerned about leaning right or left because we can lean up and bring heaven down to earth. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We don't have to be concerned about political parties because our constitution says we're no longer foreigners but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. Isn't it exciting to know that we actually have an immigration system that works? that our president has fixed the immigration system, that we're fellow citizens with the saints, that we have all kinds of policies in our constitution that work. We have an education policy. Study to show yourselves approved unto God. We have an energy policy. You are the light of the world. We have a foreign policy. There is neither Jew nor Greek, bond nor free, male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. We have a civil rights policy, that the national security policy, well, the civil rights policy says that we are one in Christ Jesus. The national security policy says the kingdom of heaven suffereth violence, but the forceful ones take it by force. An immigration policy, I love this one, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. We have an insurance policy. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Jesus said, I go to prepare a place for you that where I am, there you may be also. A debt reduction policy. Seek first the kingdom of God and everything else will be added. And of course a budgetary plan which says that we can give and it will be given unto us. I think I got those two reversed. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and everything will be added. Aren't you glad that we have a constitution in our kingdom that really works and that we're following those policies and procedures? If you're ready, let's do a deeper dive. I want to talk to you about this idea of being kingdom builders. Thank you. And I want you to turn in your source for your constitution to section Romans, subsection 12. 
Article 21. Very familiar verse, but let's look at it together. And it says this, Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. In fact, would you just read it with me? Do not be overcome with evil, but overcome evil with good. I've titled the message today, Overcoming Evil with God. Father, I thank you that you are the ultimate source of goodness. I thank you that when Moses said, show me your glory, you showed your goodness to Moses because you are the ultimate source of good. And today that we know in our constitution, we can become kingdom builders by overcoming all evil with who you are as God. In Jesus' name we pray. If you believe that, would you say amen? Amen. You know, that's a simple verse today. But is it really simple to live? Think about it for a moment. Overcoming evil with good. I don't know about you, but I realize in and of myself it's difficult to overcome evil. That I need support. I need help. I need the one source who can actually overcome evil in my life, and that is God Himself. I recognize that uh, sometimes evil is pervasive. We live in a culture that is filled with chaos, a culture that's struggling to know what's right and what's wrong. And if you do a, a deeper look at that verse, in the original text it says that do not be overcome with evil which the Greek word is kakos. Some of you are laughing. Let me say it this way. Do not be overcome with kakos. <laughs> and if you look up that word kaka, which it relates to, you're probably thinking of a definition uh, when actually Webster's defines kaka as, as a Large New Zealand parrot. But we also know it means the other thing as well. (laughs) Feces, poo-poo, let's just get it out there. My granddaughter Shiloh is in the midst of her poo-poo potty chair training. And she's learning how to go poo-poo in the potty chair. But the Bible says, do not be overcome with kakas. Because there are times that we're going to rub shoulders with a world that is spiraling toward moral depravity. I was working in the backyard, didn't realize it, but I ended up with dog dew on my shoe. Tracked it into the house when you have white carpet, that is not a good thing. My wife smelled it. I, I, I was oblivious. I was tracking it all over the floor. Of course, you know what the next hour of our lives were like, cleaning up the dog dew from my shoe. And I had this amazing revelation. And that revelation is simply that we are living in the backyard of the world. And we don't often realize it, but sometimes we are rubbing shoulders with what doesn't smell that great. And we end up tracking this this world's kakas, if you will, around with us in our lives. We're, We're tracking something that smells. We're tracking something, and sometimes we don't even realize it. And even the Apostle Paul said later on in his life in ministry, I... I am the chief of all sinners because he struggled with this understanding that because we are living in the world, we come in contact with evil, with with wickedness, and we have to overcome evil with good, with agathos, with the nature of God himself. That to be kingdom builders... There's no way in and of ourselves that we can overcome evil. It has to be the God who is living within us. In fact, if you're taking notes, would you just write this down first of all, that we overcome evil with God's presence. 
We overcome evil with God's presence. The only way we overcome it, we become kingdom builders, is to recognize that we can't do it on our own, but it's the living God who is dwelling in us that helps us to overcome it. What? Do you not know? Have you not heard that you are the house of the Holy Spirit who abides within you? What? Have you not known, have you not heard that you are the temple, the house of the Holy Spirit, God's living presence on the inside of you that makes a difference in our world? We need the tangible living presence of God to transform the world around us. I yearn for God's presence. I hunger for more of God's presence in my life, just like We hear from the psalmist, section Psalms, subsection 27, article 1. One thing have I desired of the Lord, and that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the presence of the living God all the days of my life, not just when I get to heaven, but right now while I'm living on this earth, I'm hungering and thirsting for the living God living on the inside of me. The greatest gift that I can give to my family, to my wife, to my kids, to my grandkids, is the acknowledgement that I have the presence of God dwelling with me. Did you know the greatest gift that you can give to those around you, your friends, your family, your kids, your grandkids, is the acknowledgement of God's presence abiding in you, working in you and through you. Because if we simply acknowledge that we are the people of God who have been marked by God but have no tangible presence of God, is there not something missing in our relationship with God? Can I, can I ask that again? If we simply acknowledge that we are the people of God who are marked by God, but have no tangible presence of God? Is there not something missing in our relationship with God? Because we overcome evil with God's presence. Second thing, write this down. We overcome evil with God's character. Now, I wish I could really do a deeper dive into the sovereignty of God because God's character and God's sovereignty are connected together. God's sovereignty is is God's rulership. God's sitting on the throne. And His sovereignty is connected to His character. And I think some people feel like God's character really relates to what God can and cannot do. We'll, We'll talk about God can do anything. And and we know that God can do the impossible and he can do the invisible. But let me ask you the question, can God really do anything? Can God sin? Can God lie? Can God deceive? Can God act wickedly? God cannot do anything, especially if it's outside of the moral parameter of God's character. His sovereignty is connected to his character. He's not sovereign because of what he can or cannot do. He is sovereign because of who he is. He's sovereign because he always does the right thing. He's sovereign Because of his very nature, it's not about his notoriety, it's about his nature. It's not about his competence, it's about his character. So when we understand, the more we take on God's character, the more we overcome sin and wickedness and evil. So the more I become like God, think like God, act like God, walk like God, talk like God, The more I become like Christ, I take on his character, the more I overcome sin and overcome evil. I may want to pinch your head off. 
because you make me so angry. But if I'm becoming more like God, I choose not to get angry because I want to stay within the constitution of our kingdom and function according to the moral character of God. Think about it. I may, I may want to hold a grudge or an offense or have unforgiveness in my heart towards you, but because I understand that I overcome evil with God's character, I choose not to hold a grudge. I stay within the moral framework of the Constitution and the character of God, and I choose not to hold a grudge. I may want to say things that I shouldn't say, but rather than saying them, I make a decision to overcome evil with God, to overcome evil with God's character. So I choose to remain within the moral integrity and character of God. The more I become like God, the more I will act like God, walk like God. If you want to smell like flowers, you go to a flower shop. If you want to smell like perfume, you go to a perfume shop. If you want to smell like God, you hang out with God. The more ornery I get, the more frustrated I get, the more angry I get, the more I commit myself to hanging out with God because I cannot overcome evil in and of myself. In fact, every day of my life, I'm challenged with making a decision on whether I'm going to trust in the Lord or lean on my own understanding. Joe, Joe Jakes, come up here for just a moment. Hey, my friend, so lovely to see you this morning. Come up here and stand right here. We're going to look at section Proverbs, subsection 3, article 5 and 6. Would you stand there and, and uh, let me see. Robbie, come up here. I want you to stand over here. Look at this section from our Constitution. It's very familiar. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. It's interesting, the Hebrew is batach there. And of course, again, the Old Testament was, was written within the context of, of the Hebrew language and translated into English. So it was translated trust, but the, the deeper definition underneath the, the surface of the meaning is when you trust in the Lord, you become bold. Be bold in the Lord with all your heart. In fact, Joe, you're just going to represent trusting in the Lord today. Are you willing to do that? To you're do that. already up on the stage. <laughs> yeah. Robbie, you are going to represent, and you're a, a stout guy, leaning on your own understanding. I get to play the role of the heart. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding and all your ways acknowledge him and he will direct your path. Now when it comes to the heart, we all look at the heart as a physical organ. We, we know that, but in, in our constitution, it actually means so much more. It, it means everything that's on the inside. Our heart thinks. Our heart intends. It has a will. Our heart feels. In the New Testament, we hear things like, the angel Gabriel showing up and telling Mary that she's going to birth the Christ child and she ponders, she thinks about these things in her, her heart's thinking about them. We also read in our constitution how that the word of God is quick and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow is a discerner of the thoughts and intentions ah, of the heart. So your heart has a will. It has intentions. And of course you know that the heart feels. It grieves. It has joy. So our, our heart represents everything on the inside. You, you see what I look like on the outside, but, but really who I am on the inside is my heart, my, my soul. 
and I'm confronted with the challenge of whether my heart is going to move this direction because of the character of God and trust and become bold in my relationship with the president of all presidents or whether I'm going to lean on my own understanding. And I'm not trying to, uh, to diminish the importance of intelligence or rational thinking, but all of us recognize there's a quick, quick tipping point when our heart makes a decision either to trust in the Lord or to lean on our own understanding. Let's just talk about a moment of self-gratification of, of sin. And all of a sudden, our heart in 10 seconds makes a decision. It begins moving toward leaning on our own understanding. And maybe it's not even a, a moment of sin. It's, it's about being a kingdom builder. And the Lord whispers to our heart, we're out and about in the marketplace and we hear the Holy Spirit who lives on the inside say, I want you to walk over there, begin a conversation and pray for that person. He or she needs prayer right now. And so we begin to think about it, begin to trust in the Lord, move in this direction and all of a sudden, oh Lord, that's, that's not me. I could never do that. I... That would be dumb. That would be stupid. The person would think that I'm dumb or stupid. God, they wouldn't even, they wouldn't even want prayer. And now we're leaning on our own understanding. And there's so many decisions that we make in life. Things like even returning our tithes and offerings to God, which is the be best economic plan in our Constitution. Giving 10%, the tithe to God and offerings above the 10% and how God opens up the windows of heaven because we do that and he pours out a blessing upon us and we make a decision. We're, we're going to be consistent tithers and we're going to trust in the Lord with our giving. And then all of a sudden the bills start coming in and we think, you know what? I don't know if we'll have enough money to cover the bills at the end of the month. And before long, we're leaning on our own understanding. Is, any, is anybody grabbing what I'm telling you? Thank you. Thank you. What I'm declaring to you is that we overcome evil. We overcome those, those moments of decision-making when we choose to allow God's character to become pervasive in our lives and we choose God and his constitution over those decisions that will create chaos and ultimately harm us and conquer us. Because my, my favorite word in the text, be not overcome, is the word nakao in the Greek, which actually means conquered. Do not be conquered by evil but conquer evil with good. If, if you want to be a conqueror, you have to decide to hang out with the more than a conqueror. Number three, we overcome evil with God's presence, with God's character, and with God's kingdom. I'm going to call your attention to, to one more section in our Constitution. Section Colossians, subsection 3, Article 1. And to seal it in our hearts today, I want to ask you just to read it in faith with me. Are you ready, everyone? Let's do this together. Here we go. If ye then be raised with Christ, seek those things which are above where Christ is sitting at the right hand of God. Let's pause because the next part of this is critical to our development as kingdom builders. Are you ready? Here we go. Set your mind on things above, not on things on the earth. What? You are kidding me. What? How, how is that even possible? We're living on earth we're here 
below. How can we set our minds on things above and not on things on the earth? How is that even doable? Because I'll tell you, we can become so distracted by what's going on here in earth, on earth. And we can spend so much of our time distracted in doing those things that may make the world a better place, but not the kingdom of God a better place. And I'll tell you, I've made a decision in my life to be a kingdom builder. I don't want to just make the world a better place. I certainly want to do that. But I also, most importantly, want to make the kingdom of God a better place. Because everything here on earth is not going with me to heaven. Our Constitution said we carry nothing into the world and we will carry nothing out of it possessions, money, even our own bodies. That's such a blessing to me. <laughs> that means that whether I'm buffed, or let me say it this way, not so buffed, I don't have to worry about taking this body with me. But God will give me a glorified body when I get to heaven. Whether I have wrinkles, whether... I have gray hair, silver hair. It, it's, it's not about that. I'm, I'm, I want to do something that is eternal and not just earthly. I want to do something of eternal significance and not just earthly significance. Now, please, don't misunderstand. We know that God tells us to be good stewards of what we have, good stewards of our bodies. Physical exercises is, is something that helps us to do that good stewards over our, our hobbies and entertainment, good stewards over the earth. All of those things are important. We're called to be good stewards. But what I, I want you to understand today is we must engage in those things that will last for eternity. Like what? What are, what are some things that will last? Well, let's talk about a few of those items. First of all, Winning someone to Christ. Introducing them to the kingdom of God. Did you know when you win one person to Jesus Christ, you impact eternity? You change the trajectory of heaven just by winning one person to Jesus Christ. You impact eternity all of eternity. You depopulate hell and you populate heaven. You stand at the gates of hell and you redirect the traffic to heaven. And the sad thing about it, according to, to global outreach, 90% of Christians will end up going to heaven without taking anybody with them because they don't understand how important it is to impact eternity by winning just one person to Jesus Christ. You know what it's all about? It's all about what we saw right over here. That's the greatest thing today that we've experienced in this service. It's not the preaching. It's not the singing. It's the declaration of all those people who made a public confession of their faith to say, I'm just not here to confess my sin, but I'm here to proclaim the sovereignty and rulership of God in my life. Another example of impacting eternity or investing in the kingdom is the idea of raising a godly family. I love that one. Did you know when you raise your family, your kids, your grandkids, your brothers, your sisters, that you impact generations, that next generation will carry on the kingdom of God because you imparted the life of Jesus Christ in your family. That's why attending this Kingdom embassy is so important every week. You, you do realize that 2,000 years ago when Christ died and resurrected, that our government began to establish embassies all over the world that meet weekly. 
churches coming together, not just gathering every two years or four years to make decisions for our nation, but weekly gathering together approximately two billion Christians on the planet, gathering in embassies around the world, making decisions about our constitution and our kingdom. That's what you're a part of. That's what we're a part of. Our families are a part of. We're changing the trajectory of what lasts because of what we're doing right here this morning. Raising godly families. And finally, number three, investing in the kingdom. And I'll just take a moment and say, I I so love what Pastor Jared talked about with missions today in the five lanes. That your giving actually impacts what lasts. Local missions, national missions, global missions, the college, all of the, all of the things, the, the hundred campuses that is the dream of Higher Vision Church. And I'm not dismissing the importance of investing in humanitarian uh, works or aid, but can I just tell you, when you invest in the kingdom of God, you invest in something that lasts. Let me ask you a question. You spend your entire life at Higher Vision Church and you give of your time, your treasure, your gifts, your talents. And there's only one person who comes to know Christ at Higher Vision Church. Has your giving been worth it? I think it has because you've impacted eternity. You've done something that lasts. You're investing in the kingdom. You're deciding to be a kingdom builder. And of course, with all the missions work that's going on at Higher Vision Church, that's not even a question about one soul. But what I'm trying to tell you today is that when you invest in the kingdom of God with your giving, you're doing something in perpetuity that lasts forever and ever and ever. As a leader of, presiding leader of of a denomination in 75 nations around the world, two weeks ago, we received a check in the mail from someone. It was a check for $8,000. And at the bottom of the check, it said charity. And I thought, this person really gets it. This person understands that what they just gave is going to impact the kingdom of God around the world. So today, can I just inspire you and encourage you to keep keep on giving? Keep on sharing of your gifts, your talents, your finances to the kingdom because you're investing in the kingdom of God. So here's the takeaway. Let's let's wrap it up. Our text says, be not conquered by evil, but conquer evil with good. The ultimate source is God. To be kingdom builders, we overcome evil with God. To become kingdom builders, we overcome evil with God's presence, God's character, and God's kingdom. If you believe that today, would you stand with me?